Professor Oliver Hart, welcome to Nobel Week in Stockholm. All Nobel laureates are asked to bring a thing, an artifact that is special to him or her, to the Nobel Museum here in Stockholm. What did you bring, Mr. Oliver Hart? Well, my book, the book, the one book I've written myself. Um, as explanation, let me say, unlike um, some scientists, or physicists, chemists, uh, biologists, um, or even some economists who, who do um, lots of empirical work, um, as a theorist, um, I don't have any very interesting tools uh, I could have uh, to bring. I could have brought a yellow pad mm. or a pen. <laughs> when is it from? It's from 1995. Mm. Can you show it to us? So here it is. Farm contracts and financial structure. Yes, it's very much about the work that I won the prize for. It sort of summarized my work um, up to that point. And I've done a few things since then, but a lot of it, the stuff is in here. Okay. If anybody's interested. Yeah, of course they are. Was it hard work writing this book? Well, uh, yes, uh, quite hard work in the sense that um, um, the book's different. I, I'm used to writing articles, mm. papers. A book is obviously a bigger project, and mm. just uh, putting it all together, uh, you know, is challenging. How long time did it take to write it? Um, well, it was based on some lectures I gave, mm. um, the Clarendon lectures at Oxford University, which I gave in May 1993, and the book came out in uh, October 1995, uh, and I wasn't working on it continuously um, during that period, so I, I would say it took about uh, a year. What brought you to economic science in the first place? Graduated in mathematics at, uh, from Cambridge University in 1969, and that was a time of student rebellion. Um, in many countries. And so I was thinking, you know, what am I going to do? Well, further study seemed the obvious thing. But uh, in what field? Um, I knew I wasn't destined to be a mathematician. So um, I was looking around for ways to apply mathematics, and people mentioned economics. So that was one motivation. But the other motivation was that I um, was uh, quite political at the time. I liked to engage in political arguments with people. Um, I, I'm still rather argumentative. Uh, okay. But I got frustrated because the, when I had these arguments, the, the other person would inevitably bring up some economic issue at some point in the argument. And since I knew nothing about economics, I was completely lost at that stage. So I thought I've got to you know, find out something about this field. So the combination of things is what led me to economics. Was it political arguments, or what did you argue about? Yeah, politics. Politics. Yes. yes. Uh, at what point, point did you rea realize that you had had a groundbreaking discovery? In at your what research? point? Yeah, in, in your research. Uh, well, you never quite realize it. I think getting the Nobel Prize helps you realize that <laughs> maybe it was it was okay after all. Um, I felt um, I wrote a paper with Sanford Grossman in 1986. It was published in 86. Mm. We actually wrote it, well, we started it in 1983 and um, had some, produced the, the um, unpublished version, you know, mm. but it took about three years to publish. So that paper, I felt, was um, a good one, uh, certainly by my standards. Okay. So Why? Well, I just felt there was a sort of uh, a pretty basic insight there. Mm. And uh, which, which had to do with um, incomplete contracts and, and residual control rights. So the whole idea of control being important uh, when the contracts that people write are incomplete, which they often are. So that, it was a kind of conceptual breakthrough, I thought. Mm. But of course, um, that's not the same as other people thinking it. Uh, what makes an excellent scientist, do you think? Well, I, uh, ultimately it's what they do. I, I, um, I don't know, you know, you, you can only really... Um, so the, the, um, it's all in the output, but in terms of what characteristics yeah. are important, 
Um, I wouldn't want to generalize. I, I think probably, um, well, I'll generalize a little, okay. So I think probably it's very important to be somewhat ambitious in the questions you ask. So um, you, you're never going to um, do anything uh, really striking if you are focused on just making small additions to the literature, which is tempting mm -hmm. uh, because that's a way to get papers published and to advance mm -hmm. in your career. But if you want to do something a bit more than that, you have to be willing to tackle large questions. So I think that's one thing. Um, and, and that may not come that easily. I wouldn't say I started out like that. I think I was, um, um, it's something that, that developed over time with the help of other people, co-authors, very important. Um, and the other thing I would point to is, is being willing to stick to something um, you know, perhaps for years, decades, until, you know, once, once you've found something that does, that seems um, important and where you, you feel you have something to say, then um, I think it's good to kind of stick with it until you've really um, got quite far with it. And, and you have to do that sometimes through thick and thin. So I would say of my own path that um, the topic I worked on which is the one I mentioned, incomplete con contracts and control, uh, turned out to be um, harder than I thought. Even after that paper, mm. which I thought was something of a breakthrough, it wasn't as if that was it. It turned out there were many other obstacles to making progress. And um, sometimes, um, so I, 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 stuck, I stuck with it. Okay. Even though, you know, sometimes those obstacles seemed very large and it, it was quite, would have been quite tempting to, to kind of walk away and do something else, but I didn't do that. So I think um, that's also pro probably an important quality. To stay with the to question. Be deter yeah, to be persistent. Okay. And, and to be um, uh, often, um, I mean, to, to, keep, to keep going even when, as I say, there are obstacles. And also what you're doing is not, you know, kind of hot, because in economics, just as in many other things, I'm sure it's true of other uh, uh, physics and other sciences, and uh, you know we know it's true in um, pop music or you know movies or anything. But it's it's true even in academic fields. They're things. They're fashions, um, and what you may what you're doing may not be the fashionable thing, and. Uh, so what do you do? Uh, well, uh, I think to keep going is probably important because eventually people may uh, you know, decide what you were doing is actually good after all, even though you know, the, t the attention is somewhere else. Is there any person that has inspired you in your work? You mean other economists? Yeah. Certainly people who are Ronald Coase, mm -hmm. who um, won the Nobel Prize in 1991 and started the field, uh, the, what economists call the theory of the firm. Um, I mean, I followed on in his footsteps, uh, although there's a big distance between the way I approach it and the way he mm. approached it, but I, I certainly very much admire his contributions. Uh, another person I would pick out is Kenneth Arrow, another Nobel laureate uh, who has done, did amazing things mm. in microeconomic theory um, and of course there, there are others too and also co-authors have been very important to me. Okay. Um, let's talk about your research more. If you want to, were to hire me as your re research assistant, yeah. I guess what to make a contract about my work to you. What would you think about that and what should I think about when the contract is made? Oh, um, Well I do have research assistants. I have, <laughs> um, uh, I don't have much of a contract with them. I think yeah. uh, um, although I write about contracts, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily always write very detailed contracts because mm -hmm. I think in, in some cases just a handshake or the equivalent mm -hmm. is good enough and I think with, with a research assistant mm -hmm. that's probably the case because um, neither of you is getting that locked into the relationship so um, if things don't work out um, they can go and find somebody else, mm -hmm. you can hire another research assistant. Um, 
Uh, and so I think it's enough to just give them some idea of what you want mm -hmm. uh, and you agree on the, how much you're going to pay them. Mm -hmm. Those things are important okay. to get out of the way, okay. so there's no misunderstanding about those. But then you can sort of see how it goes. Uh, in contrast, when I um, uh, had an addition put on my house it, back in um, 1996, um, well, that's when we finally did it, but um, we wrote a pretty detailed contract with the contractor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in, in fact, I described some of this in my book, uh, even though it came out a little before, I was already in the process of doing it. So I talked about applying the ideas, my ideas, to a contract with someone who's doing some work on your house, in this case quite extensive. Okay. So that I would say is not like a research assistant. Mm -hmm. It was important to uh, write something quite detailed. Um, what brought you into contract theory in the first place? Um, it was a progression, an evolution. I, I started off um, in my thesis being interested in the behaviour of firms um, in situations of uncertainty and I was, I was particularly interested in, in uh, work uh, shortly after my thesis. So this was uh, my PhD thesis, it was 1974, so the next few years I was interested in um, conflicts between different owners of a firm. So if you think of a, um, a publicly traded firm, you know, there, there are many different shareholders. Um, they're buying and selling shares. At any moment in time, there's a, a certain group of people who are the shareholders, um, and a large number of them. Um, they don't necessarily... Uh, so a question I was interested in, in is what does each of them want the firm to do? And they may not agree about what the firm should be doing. Some of them might want the firm to maximise profit, others might want something else. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve those conflicts? Um, over time I realised that maybe that wasn't the most interesting question. That was more, what was more interesting was the conflict between the manager of the firm and the shareholders. And uh, um, this is part of uh, principal agent theory, uh, which um, Actually, this, the, this prize, so my co-laureate, Bank Tomstrom, has done particularly important work in that area. But, uh, so the whole idea that the manager of a firm, the, the CEO, the board of the firm, might have different objectives from the shareholders, and how do the shareholders design incentives to bring management um, sort of into line with their wishes. Um, I thought that was sort of more interesting than the conflict among different shareholders. But that led me eventually to um, examine, or should I say re-examine, this basic question of what is a firm? Mm -hmm. And what determines, so this is now something a little different, which is what determines the set of activities mm -hmm. under this particular manager? Mm -hmm. So uh, why, you know, if you have firm A here uh, with a manager and shareholders mm -hmm. and firm B with a manager and shareholders, would it make any difference? if they, those two firms merged and became a single firm? Or why don't they? Why do we have two firms rather than one or maybe ten? And th this is the question that Ronald Coase first raised, which is why do we see so many activities taking place inside firms rather than in the marketplace? So that, that's... And to answer that question, so I got interested in that, uh, trying to do something a little more formal than what Coase had done. Uh, and also another, Oliver Williamson has also worked on this and he's mm -hmm. another lo Nobel laureate, he won in 2009. Mm -hmm. So um, they had in important things to say but they were rather informal by the standards of an economic theorist like myself. So I wanted to do something a bit more uh, formal and I realised that to tackle that question um, one had to uh, really understand contracts and okay. the limits of contracts. So. That's roughly there how go. I got into it, yeah. <laughs> do you have any advice to a young person who is interested in science? Like, how do you, what should you do to become a Nobel laureate? Try to, to be ambitious in the questions you're yeah. asking. I, I think uh, if, if you have, I mean, the, the secret is often a good question. And so, you know, you should try to um, ask something big. 
Um, sometimes it may be something that somebody has asked you. It doesn't have to be brand new, but mm -hmm. maybe you're going to you, you think, well, that there's some answers to that big question, but I don't think they're entirely satisfactory. Mm -hmm. So then you might work more on those, on, on trying to provide better answers. If you look at the world today, what do you think is the most important economic issue? You know, there's still um, countries that are very poor, and um, you know, so a big question is going to be how do they become richer? We've seen that it's certainly possible. Look at China, extraordinary success story in terms of just the economics. So, could you see that kind of um, development happening in Africa? Uh, so these are the, probably the world's big, biggest questions, mm. I would say. But yeah. then if we focus on the more advanced countries, of course, we're seeing a lot of um, political dissatisfaction yeah. as some people feel left behind um, as a result of globalization or mm. automation. And uh, I guess you know, the question is how are we going to deal with that? Um, you know, worst case scenario, it leads to a lot of political unrest and maybe even the sort of breakup of the political system. Yeah. And that would be the worst case scenario. The best case scenario is that we um, find some way to uh, make these people less dissatisfied and so that we can sort of, uh, things can return to being a bit more harmonious. Uh, you had an election in the United States. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Mr. Trump and his view of science? <laughs> I've spoken about this. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a supporter of Mr. Trump in any way. Okay. What he says scares me. Mm -hmm. Both economics and um, the rest of him, actually. I think he's, um, um, he's, he's um, encouraged... Um, expressions of racism in the United States, and that's very worrying and I think really a terrible thing. Let's get back to science then. Yeah. What is a normal day at work for you before you get the, <laughs> the information about the prize? A normal day? Yeah. Uh, a normal day would be very normal. I mean, I, it would be like many other people's days. I mm -hmm. you know, get up, <laughs> sometimes uh, you know, fairly early. Yeah. Um, how early? Well, you know, I'm usually up by around 6.30, it's not that early. But, um, and I read the newspaper, um, just to keep up with what's going on in the world. Uh, have breakfast, um, um, shower, go to work. I tend to go to, I like to work in my office. I work better there really than at home. So obviously during the um, Harvard semester, I have various obligations, teaching, so you meet students, uh, seeing students, so. yeah, talking to students about their research, mm. uh, going to seminars, mm. uh, some of which are given by students. We have lunches, brown bag lunches for um, our PhD students who present work in progress. So there's, mm. uh, you know, a certain number of the days of the week I will have those kinds of obligations, mm. office hours. Uh, but then I also have um, a number of hours during the week um, uh, uh, when I can just get on with my own work. I tend to do that in my office, okay. sit at my desk with a yellow pad mm. and a pencil okay. uh, or pen and try to make some progress on some ideas. But then there's also a lot of other stuff like writing letters of recommendation or mm. you know, people ask you for um, some, uh, some other institution yeah. Uh, is considering promoting mm. somebody, what do I think about that? So there's a lot of stuff like that as well. What's the best uh, part of your work? The best part? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the best part would be um, the research when I can get to it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work do alone do. mostly or no, together no, with others? Usually with co-authors. I think okay. uh, certainly over the years um, in economics there's more and more co-authored work mm. um, and I'm no exception to that. So I, I usually have uh, at least one co-author, okay. usually one. Bengt Holmström? Or? Um, well, I have written, <laughs> I've written a couple of papers with Bengt, mm. but um, he's not my most okay. 
frequent co-author okay. that I have, yes. Yeah. And a last question. Now I talked about a lot about your research and career, and that's very interesting. But what is important in life for you more than that? Well, family is tremendously important. I spend a lot of time with my family, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, but also my, uh, my two sons. And one of my sons, my oldest son, um, who's married with two children, um, we're very, very lucky that they live very close to us, just two miles away. Okay. So we see a lot of them. So I would say that's, you know, uh, hugely important. Uh, but I also like to do, uh, you didn't ask about my hobbies, but uh, I like swimming. Mm. Uh, I like eating, as I think we said. I like drinking a nice glass of wine. Right. Um, I used, I'm, I'm very, um, I used to be a big tennis fan. I still am. Some I like to watch tennis on television. I, I used to. I'm a pretty bad player, but uh, I don't play so much anymore. My my younger son is quite good, actually. Um, what else? I like uh, um, very much uh, movies or plays or music. I love music, and I'm playing the piano actually again after uh, a break of. Of several decades, but I'm I'm getting back to the piano. I have a, a very good teacher, and so that that's uh, that's very important to me. That sounds very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.